Holland, could you tell us about this woman who, at the time, I mean, she did an incredible job in a, in a, in a world of a macho, macho, um, in a macho world. Yeah, she um, was a woman that was working at the police department in Seattle in the 70s, and she was one of the only women doing that at the time, um, one of the fewer women. And it was because of her that they wanted to psychologically profile uh, serial killers, or at the time they were called sequence killers. And so uh, I think that so that's why she essentially got the job at um, the FBI, and she just retired with top level position there. And I think the reason she has had such an amazing career is she didn't let people get to her. Um, I think she always just, you know, she knows misogyny's there, but I love that she doesn't take it personally and she sort of just lawnmowers over them. Um, she keeps, you know, the eye on the prize, so to speak. So, uh, Daniel, uh, Ted Bundy has been a, has been a source of, of uh, scripts uh, for several Hollywood productions. What makes yours different and unique in your opinion? Yeah, I think it's one of those things where, you know, maybe that, Nate, you know, the Bundy story is just back in the zeitgeist again. You know, it just seemed like there was a succession of these. I mean, ours was sort of in development at the time that some of the documentaries came about um, about a year and a half ago. So, um, but yeah, I mean, my approach to, to the Bundy story was not, Kind of the romanticized Bundy. I didn't want to make a movie where he was kind of a misunderstood, you know, kind of uh, romantic figure in any way. I found him to be despicable, frightening, terrifying, and truly, you know, a boogeyman of my own childhood growing up in the in the seventies. It's just a scary time, and um, and I wanted the movie to reflect that this man wasn't somebody that we should hold on a pedestal or or make him out to be some sort of superhero. To me, he's He's absolutely terrifying and he's a monster. And that was the approach that I went with. And then obviously seeing that through the lens of Holland's character and Jake Hayes, who plays uh, Robert Ressler, one of the early FBI profilers that, that connects with her on this case. Um, you know, it was important for me to show their struggle and what it was like um, being in law enforcement at that time when there were very few technological resources available to them. So very different time um, in terms of crime detection. So I really wanted the movie to kind of capture the spirit of that, that era. Watching the movie, I felt uh, the victims, I, I, I couldn't understand how they were so trusting. I wouldn't trust someone. Uh, maybe it was a, uh, the age of innocence. What do you think, Holland? I absolutely think it was a different time. I mean, we are so... You know, we're aware of every event going on in the world at any moment. Within moments, we know about it because of social media and the internet. And so I absolutely think it's a different time and news traveled slower. And uh, I don't, yeah, I, I think people, you know, if the, their favorite TV show, you had to be in front of the TV, your favorite movie went out of theaters, you, right. you, you, don't, <laughs> you don't get it on DVD, you know, two months later. Um, so I think it was just a different time and people were not as informed. So, Daniel, do you consider uh, Bundy a, a crazy person or a psychopath? Which I think is different, maybe. You could be crazy and be sweet and wonderful, but perceive oh. reality in a way that... Yeah. No, I understand. I, I, you know, I, I do think that uh, Bundy was a psychopath who knew how to hide his psychopathic tendencies. He knew how to do it quite well. You know, he knew how to manipulate those around him. You talked to Holland just a moment ago about, you know, the girls that sort of willingly went. And, you know, I honestly don't think it was them being so naive. I think it was them trying to be helpful. And he knew how to exploit their good nature, their helpfulness, their kind. That's what he knew how to do. Not that he was a genius. He wasn't that particularly smart. He actually dropped out of law school or failed law school and never really was very successful at anything in life. He had very high ambitions because he was a malignant narcissist who thought that he was better than other people um, and knew more than other people. Um, he was, he did enjoy that sort of cat and mouse. He did enjoy even, even later when he was in custody, he, how he would mani manipulate the authorities. Um, and um, all the way to the, almost to the day of his execution, you know, he was, he was almost plea bargaining. I'll tell you where this one was. If you give me this much more time, you know, he was always kind of the, 
attempting to be the master manipulator. And I think that's what he knew how to do. He could prey on the sympathies of these young women uh, by pre pretending to be handicapped in some way, having a cast on his arm, walking on crutches, um, really trying to gain the sympathy of these women until he had them where he wanted and was able to render them unconscious, put them in his car, handcuff them and take them to some remote location. It was, it was just a very diabolical man. I like uh, one aspect of the film that I really like was that he, uh, in the story, he becomes an object, an object to be studied because you need to research to serial killers. And he was an example that was very disturbing, I guess. Could mm -hmm. you comment on that? Oh, uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, I think the, you know, the mind of Ted Bundy is, is still being studied today. That's why movies like this one and, and there's a, now, which I just watched over the weekend, I really enjoyed it, called No Man of God with Elijah Wood playing um, one of the profilers who really got into Bundy's head space when he was in those days leading up to his execution and in fact, years. Um, but um, yeah, I think there's always, because he's such a, a fascinating character, I feel like there's always some other part of his personality people are, are fascinated with. I think we're just endlessly fascinated with evil. And I think we, we try to kind of give voice to it because we don't understand it. I mean, if you're a normal person walking around this, this world and trying to do good and trying to help others and, and trying to do the best that we can, I, when you are confronted by something so monstrous as Ted Bundy, I think the normal reaction is we try to understand it. So, Holland, what was the attraction to play this detective? Well, I had just read a book um, called To Catch a Killer. It was a South African book that... I was trying to acquire the rights to, and it didn't work out. And it was a woman uh, of a similar story, actually profiling people in the eighties. And I wasn't, Robert Ressler also worked with her as well. And I wasn't aware of Kathleen McChesney. And lo and behold, a few months later, this script comes to me and it was this very similar story with a notable case, obviously in the States with Ted Bundy, but this was a woman doing this in the seventies. And so uh, I do think everything happens for a reason. So I was really excited to, to get to know this woman and the fact that she, she, uh, she is this rather, you know, short statured redhead, um, at least on television. Uh, I don't know why this is, but um, more often than not, they, they tend to cast detectives and police women as quite tall lith, almost like former models. And I, I love that this woman, you know, just biasly did not look like that and can kind of show Hollywood. There's all different kinds of, of uh, looking people that, that go into law enforcement. Um, so selfishly, I liked that. But um, I also think that she's a fascinating character that obviously took no nonsense. So it was a, a really fun role um, as well as an honorable role to, to, to portray. Could we say, Daniel, that there's an appetite for true crime as an audience? Oh my gosh, yeah. I mean, look, I mean, you go on any of the streamers, you know, Netflix to Amazon, Hulu, um, Discovery Plus now. I mean, there's just entire categories dedicated to crime. I mean, again, it goes back to what I said earlier. I really feel like we as a society, and, and maybe part of it is the, 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 the monotony that we've been feeling, you know, locked up in our own houses and and, you know, places of, you know, just wherever we can, you know, congregate with small groups of friends or family these days. And I think maybe, I think in, in, in times where there's uncertainty in life, I think we do turn to the darker things. I think we do turn to the stories that terrify us, that we don't understand, because I think it speaks to almost the place that we're in, you know, and I think it gives us, when we look back on these, these, stories like if it's a Ted Bundy or, you know, name your killer on any of these Netflix documentaries, which are also incredibly popular and most, most of them very well done. But I think we're always looking for that insight. And I think we're looking for that experience uh, vicariously um, coming to confront that kind of evil ourselves. For me, uh, another scary character was the mother. She oh, was right. in total denial, and uh, I don't know, yeah. I don't know, because sometimes and she you was. are, no, it was scary. Yeah, it, yeah no, uh, Lin Shay, who I, uh, 
Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to overlap. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, Lynn Shea played Ted Bundy's mother, and she's just brilliant and wonderful. And she was willing to come out and 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 participate in this project when we were one of the one of, if not the very first independent film to go into production um, at the height of the pandemic last summer. So there was still a lot of uncertainty. So I was just really grateful to Lynn and obviously to all of our cast and, and crew to kind of bundle ourselves together into this, into this bubble and these zones that we now work in. Uh, but we were kind of like testing the road a bit with this project. But anyway, but Lynn was willing to do it. And, and yes, um, the real Mrs. Bundy, Louise Bundy, truly lived in that state of denial. In fact, it was in one of the documentaries that I believe that Kathy McChesney, if, if, if it wasn't McChesney, it was one of the other interviewees, did talk about how when they played the tape for Mrs. Bundy containing her son's confessions, which he recorded shortly before his execution, her reaction was she whimpered and she listened and she sounded like, like a child, like in pain. And then all of a sudden she snapped. It's like, let's have apple pie and ice cream. I saw that in the movie she offers them the, yeah. Yeah. I thought, and oh my God. Like, that is yeah. true. That's how she really reacted in real life. How, how she just was able to compartmentalize this, you know, and put it somewhere that just felt safe for her. And, you know, I just thought she was a tragic woman, a tragic figure. I mean, I think any parent coming to the realization that your child is this monster who's done, who's, Committed these unspeakable act, I think you'd have a real reaction. But her reaction was almost a non-reaction, which made her really, really scary in her own way. You know, it's like she turned a blind eye to all of it. So, uh, Holland, how unique was uh, this character for that era? It was not usual to have a female doing all these things, right? Investigating, making decisions. Yeah, I mean, was it was definitely. Yeah, it was definitely, I think, on the rarer side. But, um, you know, I like how Kathleen McChesney, Detective McChesney, didn't think of it that way. She just thought of herself as another person doing the job the best she could. And, um, you know, perhaps I do wonder if she felt that she needed to overcompensate her seriousness or her demeanor. But regardless, it, um, she didn't let the small stuff get to her. And the, the sort of bullying or... Um, you know, side remarks. And so that's what I really appreciate about her. She didn't make it a meal. She, she really kept, you know, focused on, on her, on her task. And that's what Dan and I had discussed going into this was that we don't need to make, you know, I don't think the misogyny in her eyes was a big deal. She just sort of tossed it aside, like, you know, an afterthought. Yeah. Uh, so Daniel, my last question, why should we go and see the movie? What can... What Can you pitch it to the uh, audience? Well, I mean, this is this is a movie that, that focuses on the four years in which Bundy was on the loose and murdering women from uh, across seven different states. Um, kind of this this reign of terror that he he held over you know our country and, and certainly the young women whose lives were forever altered uh, and the families whose lives were destroyed by this man. I mean, it certainly plays like a scary movie because that was a scary story. We didn't have to go too far to make it scary because just inherent in the idea of what this man was doing. But we don't so much focus on that. I really tried to focus again on the on the efforts of the law enforcement seen through the eyes of Robert Ressler and Kathy McChesney um, and their kind of un unflappable uh, push, uh, their, their, their quest in order to stop this man before he can wreak more havoc. So, you know, Ted Bundy is seen as this almost like a cipher. You know, we don't want to understand him too much because you're going into something else. You know, that, that's not what this movie is about. It's really about the victims and the law enforcement who uh, worked so tirelessly to apprehend him. 